Uh, I guess good afternoon, <laughs> Seoul. Korea's got Seoul. <laughs> um, what a what a wonderful wonderful time to be here. You know, following the uh, the Winter Olympics and seeing the potential for unification in the Korean Peninsula is just. I was almost crying a moment ago. <laughs> um, that's what we're here to do, change the game. So my background, I've done lots of things, but one of the things I did in 1999, up and until now, is I was a market maker for in-game currencies. And I would built up all of the um, sort of game item trading and game currency trading businesses in Europe and the Americas. And I met a friend of mine, Joshua Hong, uh, who had created the free-to-play movement in the United States, had taken the business model of gaming from Korea and China, and he brought it into the United States. And so he took me to Korea, and I eventually acquired two businesses here, one called Item Mania, the other called Item Bay. And so I was the chairman of all the game currency trading in South Korea for a long time, and so this was my, my second home. I lived here from 2004, 5, 6, 7, uh, because this has always been Mecca for the games business. And it should come as no surprise, the reason why Korea is leading the world in blockchain and cryptocurrency is because Korea had been leading the world in gaming. And Korea had been leading the world in gaming because it was the first market to have real broadband internet. You know, South Korea is the place where the people have had access to these tools that have allowed these types of virtual communities and now uh, uh, communities of currencies to exist. And so uh, I came out of the games business, which is what led me to Bitcoin, from play money to real money. One thing that's often noted is because a lot of people are critical and they like to critic criticize those things they don't understand because it's human nature to fear that which we don't know. And so this was Newsweek, one of the leading publications in the world in 1995, saying the internet was going to fail, that it was only used by criminals, and that it was a fad. And this is often the misperception that we have around all emerging technologies. A lot of the same criticisms you'll often hear about things like Bitcoin and blockchain today. And it's our job to become informed. Knowledge is power. And the way that you become informed is by taking the time to invest in yourself, to listen to these conversations, to come to these events, to interact with the community, to become an informed individual. And so one of the big things that's happening that's driving this right now, there's a book called The Starfish and the Spider. Do you know what happens when you cut the leg off a spider? It walks with a limp. If you cut off its head, it's dead. But a starfish, when you cut that leg off, it grows back. If you cut that starfish five ways through the center, it becomes five starfish. It is the greatest example of a distributed or decentralized system naturally occurring in nature. And we're moving away from centralized systems to distributed and decentralized systems because of the great benefits it provides to the people. And this is something that financial institutions, again, we're trying to build a world that is win-win. This is a system where the old and the new can come together by building bridges, by doing things together. The incumbent system doesn't have to fail. The incumbent system can be upgraded. It can evolve, you know, together. And so the financial institutions have recognized the power of this technology and the potential impact it has for positive change in the world. And you can see them starting to adopt it in 2014, and especially so in 2015. Through 2016, more or less every major financial institution in the world recognized the potential of this technology and began experimenting with it. By 2017, those experiments were turning into pilots. And this is the first year of deployment where you're seeing financial institutions implementing this technology, you're seeing central banks implementing this technology, by next year you'll see a lot of that. And so it's happening in the incumbents, and it's our jobs to inform the incumbents, to inform the regulators, to inform the governments. If you want to see sensible regulation, 
You need informed regulators. If they're properly informed, they can make good, smart decisions that benefits the people. And this is a global phenomenon. Historically, if you wanted to be a visionary, if you wanted to be a dreamer, and if you wanted those dreams to become a reality, you basically needed to be in the west coast of the United States. And that's because capital formation or funding, resources for dreamers, was all there. We've now been seeing globalization of that event. And now innovation can happen anywhere. It doesn't matter where you're born. You know, the next Mark Zuckerberg or Vitalik Buterin or Dan Larimer could be from Africa, could be from North Korea. All of the world's smartest investors have invested in this space and been investing heavily. But something is changing. The capital providers, the capital formation, the venture capital that is always decided as a private club, which dreamers' dreams have the potential to become reality, those walls, those barriers are dissipating. You know, the idea of the, the club that decides who's allowed to innovate is starting to dissipate. And that's happening because of this. So in 2014, VCs, I, I started Blockchain Capital, the first venture fund financing you know, this sector exclusively. So I was the most active VC for a long time in the space. And in 2014, this industry took in capital that was comparable to the internet in 1995. In 2015, it took in capital that was comparable to the internet in 1996. But the world is very different now. Back then, it would cost $5 million to build a website to sell shoes online. That can be done with $5,000 now, thanks to open source technology. You know, thanks to this open source movement, which is what the blockchain largely is. You know, we're, we're building open source systems because we have open minds and hopefully open hearts. But what happened in 2016 is the VC said, where are the exits? Where are my returns? And so they stopped investing more capital and the market went flat. Which, the number of innovators, the number of dreamers showing up trying to make the world a better place didn't slow down. And so they had to find an alternative. And that alternative was the ICO. The idea of raising capital or, or collecting resources from a community of believers. And so the ICO market started in 2013. I'm one of the... Uh, Founding board members of MasterCoin, we invented the ICO. We did the first ICO in the summer of 2013. But for the longest time, if you were a great entrepreneur, you still wanted me as a VC. You didn't want my help as an ICO because everyone still thought the venture capitalists were the great signalers. These were the smart money. And it was largely true until Ethereum. Ethereum had offers from every major VC, Andreessen Horowitz, etc. But they said no. They said, we're trying to build something different. And they chose to do an ICO when they had every other option available to them. But still, everybody wanted venture capital. They wanted what they thought was the smart money until the Dow. When the Dow happened, the smart entrepreneurs said, whoa, I would have only raised five or 10 million from VCs, but I just brought in 150 million. This model scales. And so the really smart dreamers all said, Maybe this venture capital thing isn't the right move. Maybe I should be looking at involving my community, involving my future users, and building systems together. And this is what's happened and continues to happen. So one of the questions often asked is, are we in a bubble? I don't really think so. I mean, obviously, we're always going to see volatility in a market. You're going to see uptrends and downtrends. The pendulum will always swing. But the internet back in the 90s, at its peak, got to 6.7 trillion. And that was when it was primarily a Western, almost, almost entirely a US-driven phenomenon. And that is not adjusting for quantitative easing or inflation. I think I could make a compelling argument that that number would be 50 or 100 trillion today. You know, the real bubble is probably the world's currency markets, bond markets, and equity markets. This little phenomenon of 300 billion is still in its infancy. I like to talk about purpose. You know, why are we here? 
the, the Japanese have a term that I like to use, which is ikigai. And that is to understand what you're good at, what you love, and what the world needs. And the world needs a lot right now. You know, the world, the environment needs a lot right now. Humanity needs a lot right now. And we're in Korea. And again, what a wonderful time to be here where you have this disparity between the Korean Peninsula, between the South and the North, where you've got cousins, aunts, and uncles directly across the border, where you've got an incredible quality of life here. You've got one of the world's leading markets where innovation is happening in the most beautiful of ways. I mean, Seoul's got Seoul. And right across the border, not much more than a stone's throw away, you have people that need sustainable energy. You have people that need food. And what a wonderful time, what an opportunity that exists to bring unification to positively impact the lives of so many people back to what the world needs. When you figure out what you're good at and what you love and what the world needs, you don't even need to bother about profit. You don't even need to worry about what gets you paid because you're going to be satisfied because you will have found your life's purpose and that purpose can change. You know, you can pursue whatever dream it is, but figuring out what you're good at, what you love and what the world needs that is what we should all aspire to. And to get really good at it, I like this other Japanese term known as kaizen, and that is to do things well. Uh, coming out of World War II, uh, what the U.S.'s kind of main contribution was, there's, have you ever seen that pyramid that says good, fast, cheap, and pick two? What America did, and very successfully, is it was really fast and really cheap. We were pumping out things in scale, and that was ultimately what turned the tide in many ways at the end of World War II. But after the end of the war, we continued with that business model. We industrialized it. We institutionalized this model of good, I mean, fast and cheap. And we built a world of mediocrity. You know, let's build things because we should, not because we can. And you should build things because you've asked the question, why? What is the purpose? Why am I doing this? How is this going to positively impact the lives of others? And if you're going to do something that good, you should do it really well. Meaning do it as well as you possibly can and tomorrow try to do it even better. And that's what I like about this Japanese concept of Kaizen. Because we're not just here to serve ourselves. We're not just here to do things for our self-interest. We're hopefully not just here doing things for me. If we want to build a better world, we have to be thinking about something more than ourselves, our friends and family to start, and eventually that sphere of influence gets bigger and bigger because we care about the bigger picture. We care about the we. I think that we all have the potential to be superheroes. I like to think of rooms like this as Xavier's school for the gifted. You know, we are the return of the Jedi. We all have the potential to be superheroes, and I don't mean that in some dream sort of sense. I mean that in a real sense. Malcolm Gladwell, for example, writes books talking about what makes you great at things, and it's the idea of putting in 10,000 hours. Those are your superpowers. Those skills that you've invested in that uniquely make you special. The, those are the, the gifts that you bring, and hopefully you can share for the betterment of others. You know, be an Avenger. And when you figure out what those superpowers are, and if you don't know what your superpower is, it's something you should spend some time thinking about. Because we all have them, or the potential to have them, if you focus on them. And then what do you do with those gifts? Do you use those gifts to serve yourself? Or do you use those gifts for others? You know, often people will start out by saying, here's what I do, here's my company, here's what I need. I like to, when you introduce yourself to someone, start with what your superpower is. Start with your gift. Because that will allow others to very quickly, quickly figure out what it is that you can do to help them. And pay it forward. You know, Take these skills that you've developed and figure out how to use them for the betterment of others. And I promise you'll get paid. <laughs> Money doesn't need to be your focus. Quite frankly... It's often the, it's, it's the wrong motivation. You will get everything you need if you're doing well in the world. And that takes me to this point. This is, you know, if we're going to change the game, it starts with changing the definition. You know, what is a billionaire? 
A billionaire to me isn't someone that's played the game of self-interest or compounding interest to the point that they've accumulated a lot for themselves. A real billionaire, a better billionaire, is someone that is positively impacting the lives of a billion people. And that is what all of us here are doing. You know, there are billions of people on the planet today that don't have bank accounts. There are billions of people on the planet that are underbanked, that don't have the basic needs met. We are democratizing the global financial system in a way where every human being on the planet is going to have equal access. The least fortunate billions of people on the planet are going to rise out of poverty as we move away from this scarcity mentality to building a world of abundance. Meaning we can all be billionaires, the real kind. I'd like to talk about this briefly just because, you know, geometry and math, you know, are the things that have allowed what we're doing to exist. These are the five platonic solids, but uh, this is the one some of you may know as, as EOS, um, but EOS didn't invent this symbol. This is not just a cool logo. That is a chestahedron. A chestahedron is the sacred geometrical shape of the heart. And if you take the word heart, and you take the H and move it to the end, it becomes earth. The symbol that sits inside that chestahedron is the decatria. These are the geometric uh, uh, symbols of the heart and earth. And it should come as no surprise that the heart envelops the earth, because we're trying to build a better world. Um, whether you're interested in, in what EOS is doing or not, I do highly recommend every one of you learn what a block producer is. A block producer in a delegated proof of stake system is the equivalent of the miner. But instead of having lots of miners running graphics cards or ASICs, you're building real infrastructure that you can build big consumer applications or dApps on top of. And this is the governance. And we should all be familiar with the governance. We should all be involved. And it doesn't matter whether EOS is the right blockchain. I'm, I'm chain agnostic. I believe if anyone succeeds in making the world a better place, that's a good thing. And too often these days, you're seeing what looks like religious fanaticism. It's where people are saying, my religion or my blockchain is better than your blockchain. Haven't we learned over the last few thousand years that that isn't a good approach? That it isn't working? You know, shouldn't we be here to help elevate each other? And if people are trying to do good things, shouldn't we be there to support them? even if we disagree with their approach, even if we think our approach might be the better one. It's all just a, uh, an experiment. We're all just A-B testing things that will make this world a better place at a time that we need it. Are any of you familiar with what this is? This is uh, that's a picture of Burning Man from the sky. This is probably the most important social experiment that's ever been conducted. It's, uh, it's an experiment of decentralization of governance. Um, you know, it is what I like to think of as the community uh, that makes what we're doing here all possible. You know, the blockchain is the technology. You know, this is the ethos. I like to talk about, you know, what do you believe? This is a, a picture from a friend of mine, Peter Ruprick, uh, and it's a piece of art made by Laura Kimpton. And Peter was someone that had been working at McKinsey and, you know, living his traditional life. And one day he woke up and said, I want to pursue the arts. I want to become a photographer. And he spent seven years becoming a photographer, spending and depleting all of his savings that he made as a business person. And he was out at the end of the world, at the trash fence, contemplating life and asking the universe, am I doing the right thing? Please give me a sign. And in that moment, the sky parted, the sun emerged, much in the same way you see, and he jumped on his bicycle trying to race to that point on the playa, and he eventually pulled up to this sculpture, but there were no people there, and he's like, this is beautiful, but can you give me another sign? Am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right path in my life? And in that moment, an art car comes up, and people start jumping off of this double-decker bus to stand on this statue, and they all start making this pose, and there's no music. They're not dancing. And he's like, who is this brilliant photographer that was able to capture this moment? Wow, I wish it had been me. 
but no photographer was there. No one's taking a picture, and as an artist that respected other people's work, he's like, I don't, I'm not here to steal the shot, but where's the photographer? What are these people doing standing here? And eventually he realized this shot was for him. He took that photo, was only able to get one, and immediately the bus comes back and the people get off and leave. You know, it's good to believe. I like to talk about Puerto Rico because there's a few places in the world right now where magic is happening, and we're in one of them right now. What's happening here in Korea is, I, I, I was almost crying. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful time to be here, to see the potential to positively impact the lives of your neighbors, your family and friends. Puerto Rico is another one of those places that needs help, and it has the potential. 3,000 of the greatest blockchain entrepreneurs, those with intellectual capital, human capital, and financial capital, are moving to Puerto Rico to figure out how to bring this open source, decentralized, systems to bring power back to the people, to bring food you know, to the people, the same sort of thing that can be done right here on this border. Um, there's a great project, Switch, um, uh, comprised of amazing people that are here, and they're looking to build uh, sustainable, uh, clean energy. They're looking to bring solar grids to the DMZ, to be able to bring power to South Korea, but ultimately to North Korea, and this is, this is just a project that, you know, again, it makes me want to cry. And it's happening here throughout this entire Pacific Rim. This is kind of that Pacific century, and it's because gaming was popular here. It's the gamers that are creating the economic incentives, the gamification of systems to incent the right behaviors, the right things, the right projects. Um, what a wonderful place to be. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, we are the only ones that ever have. And back to changing the game, uh, this concept of a billionaire. You know, most people are playing the game of compounding interest. You know, playing the game of how do I serve myself and my self-interest. We can do compounding impact. You know, what are the KPIs? What are the metrics that you're optimizing for? You know, in Bhutan, for example, there's this concept of gross national happiness. What is it that you're optimizing for? Let's change the game. And again, back to belief and understanding that you can do anything. I, I'll close this out on uh, Stephen Hawking's. I don't know if we have audio or not. I don't believe we have audio, so I'll, I'll just talk briefly about what Stephen Hawking's is saying here. It's a Stephen Hawking's quote. This is a man who shouldn't have been able to do anything more with his life. You know, if you had watched what Stephen Hawking went through, you would have said, this is not a person that is going to make an impact any longer. He's not able to do anything. And look at what that man was able to accomplish without any of his physical abilities. If Stephen Hawking can impact the world around us to the degree that he can in his condition, what can you do? Anything is possible. We can make the world a better place, and the world needs it now. Kamsamida.